And, and Ross, when you say that that Elon Musk is eroding the brand, I'm just interested because a lot of people, Ross, when they think of Tesla, they think Musk. And when they think Musk, they think Tesla. I mean, they think of him as just foundational. Are you suggesting you'd like him to sort of exit stage right here? No, I mean, really, it's just to sh shut up. I mean, you know, he spends his weekend just railing on immigrants and the immigration issue and he himself being an immigrant and it, the perception of somebody who's intelligent, who can get an H-1B visa, you know, saying that people who don't have educations don't deserve to be in this country is really not a way to sell cars, especially in a state like California, its biggest market where Tesla sales are down year over year. One must finally accept the reality that Elon's, you know, white supremacist motivations is absolutely damaging the brand because he is equated to Tesla. But to pretend that he's not damaging the brand at this point is simply ignorant. So, Ross, how do you fix it, right? Because, you know, there have been suggestions. I know you yourself had um, sort of a, a short-lived run for the board at Tesla. Um, there have been suggestions that the board is too close for him, that they're not sort of keeping him in check. But is there any realistic expectation that there could actually be independent or more independent board members added at Tesla? Well, I think this is the pickle and, and one of the reasons we're, we've sold you know, a big chunk of stock was because I don't see how this works because, you know, when I ran for the board, I realized very quickly that there was actually no desire for independence or any retail investment, you know, representation on the board at all. You know, I was like, you know, this is definitely not a welcome wagon, you know. And so, you know, I got out of it and now I've decided to sell some of my stock because I think that's what investors have to do um, when the company and the board isn't going to behave in the best interest of its shareholders, which is, it's really behaving in the best interest of one of its shareholders and not the other 87%. So I think this is a real problem for Tesla. I don't see how the board can move forward in its current makeup because anything they do will be sued because essentially Delaware has ruled that it's not an independent board. And it's a requirement you know, that it is an independent board. So if they get new board members that are truly independent of Elon, this isn't going to work very well for Elon, and I'm sure he doesn't want that. And, you know, I want to make it very clear. It's not my goal to be on the board of Tesla. I'm done with that. I have no desire at all. And nor is it my goal to see uh, Elon leave Tesla. My goal is for Elon to leave Twitter and to go back to Tesla. He needs to get off Twitter and stop making his outrageous opinions known to the public on a daily basis and go back to his job as CEO of Tesla. And, and that's really what needs to happen. And so, you know, if that doesn't happen, I think Tesla's drifting, you know, in a place where I don't know where it goes until there's somebody or somebody on the board that actually wants to confront Elon and expects Tesla to get better results. Brian, let's talk about the top plays within the sector, because I think declining demand for EVs, that was one of the overall narratives that came out of this past earnings season. Is some of those fears, is that overblown at this point? Well, I, I think we have a situation where the pace of innovation uh, has in, in many ways moved faster than the expected adoption curves uh, for uh, for this, these technologies, particularly on the electric vehicle side. So, you know, automakers find themselves asking critical questions about their development. Um, I think that um, the electric vehicle future is an inevitability. I think the question has really become it's a matter of when, and that when keeps getting pushed out. And that, that's that's something that we've always felt here. Um, a lot of the excitement, a lot of the uh, enthusiasm for electric vehicles is really centered on early adopters to start. Um, some of the use cases I think that are coming forward or that are really exciting aren't necessarily in your, the traditional light vehicle market. Um, but as we kind of look forward, I think, um, you know, we're, we're fairly excited about what's going on in the internal combustion engine portion of the market and really kind of the push out of uh, what that means for uh, for the broader ecosystem. So, you know, we are seeing growth in electric vehicles just at a slower pace than uh, than we than would otherwise have been expected. So, Brian Pross here. So talking about the big three in particular, you note that you know, the adoption curve hasn't really happened as much as they would like it to, or they're deeper as much as they want it to. What did they get wrong here, and what can they actually do to, to kind of course correct and make them better plays? I don't necessarily know that they've done anything wrong per se. They needed to have the, mar or the, uh, the products uh, ready to go. Um, the fact of the matter is that we're in this period now where 
um, tens of billions of dollars are really being spent on an annual basis by the big three um, towards electric vehicle production. And it's coming at a, at a um, uh, with, with an uncertain outcome as far as what, if those vehicles will be adopted and, and, and when. But the reality is they need to be there. They need to be there from uh, a, uh, a customer standpoint eventually, but they also, from a government standpoint, need to have in, invest this capital to, to, to right-size their, uh, their own vehicle uh, framework over the course of the next decade. Um, what we're going to see, though, uh, and, and this has really kind of borne itself out, whether it's, whether it's GM, whether it's Ford, and whether it's Tesla, is that um, the CapEx is going to be high, cash flow is going to be lower, and the margins are going to be lower uh, than, than they would have otherwise thought. So that's what that that's the uh, the reality of the situation right now for the automakers. Um, it's created some nice opportunities elsewhere in in the uh, in the automotive ecosystem, but right now it, it's it's a relatively difficult time on, from a uh, uh, from the last 15 years basis for uh, uh, for the traditional automakers. This new report just showed that investors who are betting against Elon Musk are sacrificing future gains for present unrewarding sentiments. And in the end, it could only lead to bad investor decisions. A little to no ROI on the future prospects of the company too, and other things as well. It's a really difficult time. One of the areas, at least within your portfolio and investment thesis here, it really leans into predictable resiliency. Where does that lead you to in terms of specific names? Sure. So for better part of 45 years, um, our firm, led by Mara Gabelli, has followed the auto industry. We held a uh, conference in Las Vegas uh, um, showcasing the automotive aftermarket. So there's uh, about uh, 285 million cars on the road uh, in the U.S. that compares to the 16 or 17 million that gets sold from a new vehicle basis. So, you know, we, we really think in terms of uh, the life cycle of a vehicle. Um, it's taken us to great places, uh, great investments like Genuine Parts over the course of the last 45 years, o O'Reilly, et cetera. Um, but we like the dealer space, uh, specifically a company like an Auto Nation, that's the, the second largest dealer group in the U.S., tickers AN there. Um, it is a business that is growing its, its after sales or its parts and service business um, by low double digits while uh, it uh, services the vehicles um, that it sells over the course of the last uh few years that are, are becoming more complex, everything from uh, active safety to advanced propulsion to uh, infotainment systems. These are becoming more difficult for the traditional aftermarket to uh, fix. So a company like AutoNation, which uh, will still sell uh, through traditional dealerships, new vehicles and, and used, um, is really taking advantage of uh, what is the, um, the profit center of, uh, of that dealership uh, uh, group. To really grow that parts and service business, drive free cash flow, expand the business, and, and ultimately buy uh, buy back quite a, a, a bit of its uh, own stock in the process. So, Brian, looking at uh, broadening out the big, the bigger, the big automakers, right? Uh, as a value yeah. investor that Gabelli Funds focuses on, when do the automakers look interesting for you guys as, as an investment? It's a really good question. You know, automakers traditionally have been cheap uh, from a statistical standpoint. You know, we're really looking for what the catalyst can be uh, for these stocks over the course of the next five to 10 years. I, I think you have to look in terms of um, initially price. And, you know, it's hard to it's hard to say that, it, you know, GM at, at five times earnings or Ford at, uh, at, at six times earnings uh, is expensive. But the real question, you know, as a value investor, you have to ask yourself is um, it, when do when do you just say it's cheap for a reason? And I think. Um, you know, I'm not ready to say that exactly, but I think given the amount of capital investment that needs to come into these um, these industries over the course of the next five years, um, given the lower margins we're going to see, I mean, you know, Ford, to their credit, uh, is showing um, the uh, amount of investment and in, in negative income that comes from uh, the Ford E uh, movement. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I, I think it's difficult as a value investor to really say. Uh, right now, that that this is the right time, the shares are going to take a 20% dip. Then you know that that might change just from a trading perspective. But you know we uh, we are really looking for catalysts in stocks, and it, it's hard to see that right now uh, for the traditional automakers. So should investors be buying the dip per se in Tesla at this juncture? Tesla is a really interesting situation. You know, um, 
again, we are a value investing community uh, at, at Gabelli, and you're talking about a company that um, you really need to have confidence that there is a piece of the Tesla story that goes well beyond traditional automaking. Stock is going to earn somewhere between three dollars and three fifty or four dollars for this coming year. And if you're thinking about a stock trading just below two hundred dollars, are you? What are you going to be paying forty-five or fifty times earnings for? Is it is it for um, a decelerating top line in its traditional auto business? Is it for the potential down the road for there to be robo taxis? Is it for AI? Um, so, you know, while Tesla shares have uh, have declined over the course of the, the last year or so. Um, you know, we're not necessarily ready to say that it is, it is a value stock. It's certainly become more interesting at these levels than it, than it has been in some time. Uh, and I, I do think that, um, you know, for a company that is, is going to be the leader in electric vehicle development over the course of the next decade, is there, there are some really exciting things going on. But um, can't definitively say that um, there's a price that, that I'm, I'm loving diving into uh, to Tesla unless I see unless I really believe that there is a um, an, an AI story here that, that I want to invest. Elon Musk is a figure who inspires strong emotions. He's lauded as a visionary genius by some and dismissed as a reckless egomaniac by others. Now, this intense public opinion can have some surprising ripple effects, particularly impacting investors' perceptions about Tesla and its stock. So the questions remain, uh, how people avoiding Tesla and making bad investment decisions simply because they dislike Elon Musk. And this is solely an emotional decision. Or is it? Or is there something more at play here? These are the questions that we're going to answer, so buckle in and let's dive in. Move your company out of Delaware before they lock the doors. That's what Elon Musk posted to his social media platform X. This comes as a Tesla CEO continues his campaign to reincorporate Tesla in Texas instead of Delaware. Now, two weeks ago, a Delaware judge invalidated the $56 billion compensation package that Musk earned as CEO of the EV company. Now, Musk then vowed to move immediately to hold a shareholder vote on, that te on Texas incorporation. The vote hasn't been scheduled, but if it is, what do Tesla investors need to know? Well, joining us now on this is John Coffey, Columbia Law School professor and director of the Center on Corporate Governance, and our very own legal reporter, Alexis Keenan. A uh, big welcome to you here, uh, John. So first, for, for people who are trying to get up to speed here, what is it that shareholders need to know when they're being asked about reincorporating in Texas? Well, they need to know, first of all, that the CEO or the controlling shareholder may have interests different than their own, and Delaware will put them under some degree of scrutiny. Uh, other jurisdictions, like Nevada, are advertising that there'll be very little judicial oversight, and that's what some CEOs want. Uh, uh, institutional investors, however, often hold the majority of the stock. The cases where we're seeing this kind of migration to the new jurisdiction are cases in which the controlling shareholder has the vote locked up. Either he owns 50 percent or he has de facto control because many shareholders do not vote and a 40 percent block is actually a de facto controlling shareholder. John, now there's a broader issue here, though, at play in that a controlling shareholder, uh, if you argue that Musk is, in fact, a controlling shareholder in this instance, that they are electing the independent board members uh, and therefore can, whether it's Delaware's court, whether it's another business court in another state, can those uh, independent directors really protect the minority shareholders? Well, I think the more that the directors are selected by the CEO, the lesser the likelihood that you'll get true independent scrutiny. Normally, we want an independent nominating committee of truly independent directors selecting the new members of the board. That's what you'll see in the, the large public corporations. But companies like uh, Tesla and Twitter, well, they're used to having one charismatic controlling shareholder, and the shareholders may come in expecting that they are betting on the success of that shareholder. So there is less uh, desire for independence. 
And so, John, Delaware is, of course, the legal home to just over two-thirds of the Fortune 500 companies, and that's been increasing over the past five years. But when you look at the sort of protections that are offered in Delaware versus some of these special business courts in Nevada and Texas, what should people be aware of in terms of sort of how they're leaning towards some of these officers and directors in some states versus in Delaware? Well, from Delo from the perspective of, a, of a, an independent person, what you know is companies often want Delaware because they can eliminate juries in any trial. All cases in Delaware involving corporations are going to be heard by judges only in the so-called court of chancery. Uh, that means you don't have the risk factor of a runaway jury. Juries can get the bit in their teeth and decide to make rulings that look against the weight of the evidence to others. All right. Uh, the new there is a recent data titled Meet Elon Musk version 2.0 by Mike Murphy, and it cites how people have different opinions about the CEO of Tesla. Now, Elon Musk has been the subject of several controversies and discussions. People either love or hate him or are not exactly his fans and sit somewhere in the middle. And while Musk's achievements in electric vehicles, space exploration, and, well, memeing are undeniable, there's a whole flip side to the Musk coin. Hey guys, welcome back to Tesla Tomorrow. One big point of contention is Elon Musk's unpredictability and sometimes impulsive behavior. Remember that time he smoked weed on a podcast and that singular act sent Tesla's stock price on a roller coaster ride? Yeah, not exactly the picture of stability that some investors crave. Additionally, his tweets can be sort of polarizing. From off-color jokes to controversial opinions, his social media presence can leave people feeling like they're walking on eggshells. Another criticism is his treatment of workers. There have been some reports about how long hours have demanded a lot from his staff, leading to some questioning his commitment to employee well-being. Basically, some folks are wary of Musk's immense wealth and influence, and they argue that the concentration of so much power on one individual, no matter how innovative, is unhealthy for society. And they even point out the potential for manipulating markets and influencing public discourse, raising concerns about long-term implications. Now, as much as these things can be seen as just some sort of criticisms thrown Musk's way, it must also be keeping some investors away from the stock. No doubt Musk is said to be the heart of Tesla and the brain behind the car company, and his leadership may not exactly be what some investors want or admire. So how is Elon Musk's leadership keeping investors away from Tesla? And why is this a big deal? Let's find out. But before we do, if you like this type of content, hit that like button, subscribe and turn on post notifications to keep up to date on everything going on with Tesla. Firstly, let's take a look at the elephant in the room. There's definitely a segment of the population who actively avoid anything associated with Musk because of their personal feelings towards him. Whether it's controversial tweets, his larger-than-life persona, or a simple general dislike for his business, we think that this aversion can lead to something bigger, probably a complete write-off for Tesla as an investment option. And that's where the problem lies. You see, the stock market, like many things, is rarely black and white. While emotions can undoubtedly influence individuals' decisions, attributing the entirety of Tesla's performance or any investment decision for that matter solely on Musk's hatred would be a gross oversimplification. And let's also remember that while the decision of whatever or what to not invest in when it comes to Tesla or any other company for that matter is a personal one, it's also important to base one's choices on a well-rounded understanding of the company, the market, and the broader economic landscape rather than just your personal feelings towards the CEO. Investors have got to keep their emotions in check and approach investment decisions with a rational and well-informed perspective, as that is key to weathering and navigating the complex world of finance. Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. We want to dive into the outlook for the EV space. It's time to hit the brakes. Joining us now is Garrett Nelson, Vice President and Senior Equity Analyst of CFRA Research. All right, Garrett, so you have a note out on Rivian. Um, and before we dive into that, what is the outlook overall for the EV space when you think about uh, Rivian or Tesla, et cetera? What is it looking like now? Sure, thanks for having me. Well, we've been sounding the alarm on the EV space for some time now. And I think what you saw this week with earnings from Rivian and Lucid are um, even heightened concerns surrounding, a, especially a lot of the upstart EV companies such as those two. Um, that you know, demand is has really uh, hit a brick wall here 
and both companies guided for flattish production in 2024. Lucid guided for slightly higher year over year. Rivian guided for slightly lower. Um, and you know th those uh, that guidance was well below street expect expectations. And so I think what you've seen with this precipitous drop in both stocks over the last couple of days is that there's a real risk that each company is now entering a, a terminal decline fit, uh, stage and there's not much they can do to prevent it absent a, a massive resurgence in demand uh, for their EVs, which we just don't see right now. So, um, you know, the, 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 the risk surrounding these two companies has, has really uh, gone way up. And then when you think about the risks surrounding these companies, there was a period of time where you saw this kind of talk about broader EV adoption uh, beyond just a Tesla. In fact, I, I saw a Rivian a tr a truck yesterday, but it's rare to see one of those, to your point. Uh, and Rivian is confronted with the challenges with demand for its vehicles. Uh, what are the top three flags or challenges that you're seeing uh, for the road to wider adoption when you think about the EV space? Yeah, there's a few problems for the smaller companies, you know, like Rivian and Lucid, you know, look at Rivian's guidance. They, they expect to produce 57,000 vehicles this year. Lucid, just 9,000 vehicles. They're competing with the likes of Ford, who, who uh, sold 2 million vehicles in the U.S. last year, and GM, who, who sold uh, 2.6 million vehicles. And so uh, it, it's really difficult for them, for these companies, to achieve economies of scale and drive down their unit costs and really turn the corner uh, toward profitability. And so, um, but, you know, EV, EV adoption rates in the U.S. have, have been fairly disappointing. Um, only 7.6% of all new vehicles sold last year were EVs. Uh, compare that to Europe, where EV adoption was about 15% last year, and in China, about 22%. So. Um, I think consumers have really become a lot more educated about EVs, and, and there's a lot more interest in, in hybrids um, than than pure pure battery EVs. And so, you know, that's the biggest shift that we've seen in the marketplace over the last several months is really this you know, interest in, in in hybrids and and this waning interest in pure battery EVs. Tesla has upheld its values of excellence, innovation and ambition by striving to achieve the highest standards of quality, creativity and aspiration. This is also a company that has made an impact on the world by inspiring and empowering millions of people to embrace and adopt their EV lifestyle, and also by influencing and challenging other automakers to follow suit and compete in the EV market. And this kind of reputation right here is one that Tesla has built, and Elon Musk played a critical part in its success, which is why we think Tesla actually needs Elon Musk and the CEO's personal life has nothing to do with Tesla's success. And now Tesla's vision to, is to accelerate the world's transition towards sustainability and sustainable energy, and its mission is to create the most compelling car company of the 21st century. But none of this would be possible without the visionary leadership and genius of Elon Musk. Musk is not just the CEO of Tesla. He's also the chief product architect, the chief engineer, the chief designer, and the chief innovator. He is also involved in every aspect of Tesla's business, from setting the strategic direction to developing the technology, designing the products, overseeing production, and even engaging with customers and the public. He's also the driving force behind Tesla's culture of excellence, creativity, and ambition. And unlike some investor claims, Tesla's success does not depend on Elon Musk's personal life. Several critics have argued that Musk's personal life is a distraction and liability for Tesla, and his controversial behavior could harm the company's reputation and performance, but that's not entirely true. In fact, these critics are clearly missing the point. Here's why. Tesla's success does not depend on Elon Musk's personal life, but on his professional achievements and contributions. The automaker's success is measured by financial results, its customer satisfaction, product quality, technological innovation, and environmental impact. And on all these fronts, Tesla's been outstanding, thanks to Elon Musk's leadership and vision. Likewise, Elon Musk has seen his wealth propelled upward over the past 10 years with the meteoric rise in value of Tesla share prices, which gained more than 4,000% in the decade since their IPO. He also owns significant shares in SpaceX, which was reportedly given a private valuation of $137 billion earlier this year. In late 2021, 
Forbes named Elon Musk the richest person in history, with a fortune nearing $300 billion. So you see, Tesla actually needs Elon Musk and not the other way around. I, I want to ask really quickly, I know we're talking mainly about Rivian and Lucid, uh, but when you think about Tesla, they've even had some challenges recently. Does some of the adoption issues stem from the concerns about range and the issue of, you know, how how effective can wider adoption be when you have this uh, worry about range and the ability to go from one place to charge to the next place to charge? There are, there are a plethora of concerns, but I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, range anxiety is real, and that's, uh, from our research, the number one impediment to more widespread EV adoption. Um, you know, lack of charging stations. If you look at the charging infrastructure, really highly concentrated in, in states on either the East Coast or West Coast. So um, broad swath of the country, uh, of, of the central U.S., really lacking in charging infrastructure. But, um, you know, charging times are an issue. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that that's why there's been more interest in hybrids. Um, you know, a lot of these hybrid vehicles uh, can, can go 40 to 50 miles uh, on battery power alone. And then have the optionality where if you're going on a longer trip, uh, you can fill up the gas tank. And so, you know, uh, you know EV charging times are, are, are a big problem, though. And, and the charging infrastructure, uh, aside from Tesla superchargers, um, you know, most chargers take a very long time um, to, to, to charge a battery. They do. So uh, I, I don't have an EV, but I've rented one before. And if you're not at a supercharger, it's, you know, you're looking at hours to uh, charge it. Uh, but let, let's talk a little bit about Rivian. Uh, you have a bearish note out on Rivian. Uh, the stock is matching what your expectations is. Uh, you all see it as a sell. Uh, uh, previously had it at a hold. Uh, it is down uh, double digits today. Uh, what's your thesis behind this downgrade? Yeah, it's that, look, the company still has more cash than debt on the balance sheet, about $4.3 billion of net cash at the end of the year. But the concern is more with, with losses going forward and also the, the uh, adjusted EBITDA guidance that they provided for 2024, um, you know, in which they're expecting to cut their EBITDA loss by about $1.3 billion compared to last year on volumes um, – that they expect to be slightly lower. So really, in our view, that's wishful thinking. And so what the guidance really showed is that these losses are going to continue for the foreseeable future. Um, and, and also, they're guiding for much higher uh, capital expenditures in 2024 because uh, they're breaking ground on a new factory in Georgia. Um, so that's going to be a further ga uh, uh, weight on their cash flow. And so really, the outlook is, is, is not good. Um, you know, looking out over the next several quarters. And Garrett, final thoughts on the EV space, because to your point about what the production expectation is, Lucid number really stand out to me, Rivian as well, but Lucid just expecting to produce 9,000 vehicles. To your point about competition and pricing, what are your final thoughts about where this space is headed? Yeah, these companies just don't have the scale to really turn the corner and compete with larger automakers whose um, gas-powered vehicle businesses are still very profitable. And, and those businesses, those sides of the businesses are subsidizing the EV side of the business, which are, are generating losses uh, almost across the board for the traditional automakers. So, um, you know, it, it's a very difficult backdrop going forward for, for the upstart EV manufacturers. We've already seen a ha handful of bankruptcies or going concern warnings. Now we're seeing real risk of terminal declines for some of these uh, EV manufacturers that have actually reached the uh, production phase, such as Lucid and Rivian. And so I think that's what the equities are, are telling us this week. What some people fail to realize is that beyond hating Tesla CEO, there are several other factors contributing to a company's growth. And good ones like market trends, the overall market sentiment plays a significant role in Tesla's growth as a company. If the tech sector, or the EV market specifically, is experiencing a downturn, it can naturally drag down Tesla's stock price with it, regardless of Musk's personal brand. Likewise, Tesla, like any company, is ultimately judged on financial health and future prospects. Investors analyze factors like production targets, sales figures, and potential competition, 
before making any investment decisions. These factors raise concerns. Well, they could lead to a decline in investor confidence, impacting the stock price. Other external factors like global economic events, interest rate changes, and even unforeseen circumstances like pandemics can also significantly impact the entire stock market, including Tesla. So while certain segments might avoid Tesla due to their dislike for Musk, it is also crucial to remember that the stock price and stock market is a complex beast influenced by a multitude of factors. Attributing its performance solely on personal opinions about the CEO would be a disservice to the intricate dance of various economic forces at play. Think about the potential consequences for letting personal feelings cloud your investment judgment. For one, completely dismissing a company like Tesla solely because you dislike the CEO could lead to investors missing out on potentially lucrative opportunities. And as it is said, the goal of investing is not to judge the personalities behind the companies, but to make informed decisions based on the sound financial analysis and broader understanding of market trends. What do you think though? Let us know down below and don't forget to tell us what your valuation of Tesla is. And if you want to know more about what Tesla's been up to over the last few days, go ahead and click on this next video on your screen. See you there.